Hello, everybody. Welcome to Let's Get Physical, the resurgence of physical game media. Um, I'm Kelsey. I'm co-owner of Pink Gorilla Games. Uh, I'm Douglas Bogart, co-founder of Limited Run Games. If you haven't heard of us, we are a video game store and a really cool company that does uh, physical releases, limited physical releases, excuse me, of indie games mostly. Former on the ladder. Yeah. Um, so, thanks for coming to my panel. I know Angry Video Game Nerd is uh, also presenting, so you either couldn't get in or you just didn't care. So, I appreciate that. I didn't care. I, didn't care. I, didn't care. I can get angry if you want, yeah. <laughs> or, or, you're, or you're here for Kelsey, which means my plan worked. So, so we'll go ahead and get started with some uh, introductions, even though we kind of just did, but, you know, whatever. Also, welcome to Comic Sans. I don't, that, he that, made this horrible PowerPoint, so yeah. you can take it up with him. <laughs> it was that or papyrus, so... Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Alright, so again, I'm Douglas Bogart, the co-founder of Limited Run Games. Uh, previous experience is um, I did technical and customer support at Ubisoft for a long time. Um, I also have an extensive sales and customer service background at Best Buy, which, you know, boo, but that rewards 20% thing is pretty nice that they do. Um, I was also the community, still technically the community manager of Mighty Rabbit Studios. It's our development side where we made Breach and Clear and Saturday Morning RPG as well as Breach and Clear Deadline and a bunch of other stuff coming out. Um, quick random facts about me, my first console, technically I had an Atari growing up, but it was my dad's. The first one that was physically mine was a Super Nintendo. Um, and then my favorite console is the Dreamcast. The other co-founder of Limited Red Games is also of uh, his favorites, the Dreamcast, and we both grew up playing and maxing out the hours on the counter for Fantasy Star Online. And I continue playing that even now in Japanese and sending Sega an email about uh, every two weeks begging for Fantasy Star Online 2. So, yeah, I know. They already told me no for Yakuza 5, so if anybody was going to ask me about that today, there's your answer. Now we got her. Hi. I'm a co-owner of Pink Gorilla Games, and I also host a podcast called Game Blitz Show, Game Blitz Podcast. Uh, I also do a little bit of PR events and marketing for a marketing firm in Seattle called Lady Killer, so I kind of do a lot of random stuff. Um, my first console was the original Game Boy, and I've sort of been a handheld person ever since. I got interested in his company because I'm a huge Vita fan, and no one's publishing for the Vita, so these guys. <laughs> uh, my favorite console is any handheld, really. Play a lot of Vita and 3DS these days, and I like Monster Hunter, Persona th uh, 3, and JRPGs in general. I wanted to comment and say I was really surprised to see Persona 3 because that's my favorite Persona. Really? And everybody okay. gets mad at me for not liking 4. No, 4 is good. But I like 4, but I, 3 just really, I don't know, the atmosphere in it. I think maybe it was the whole like shooting yourself in the head thing that got me. All right, so. He's got the hair for Yeah, us. and I'm, I have the same hair as the main character, but <laughs> it's not blue. So, let's get into it. So you're here because you like physical media, and you like you like the idea of getting something and uh, basically being able to display it and show off and be like, look what I've got, and like something that's going to be with you forever. And another thing about physical is like I can associate a memory with everything I've bought. So like Dreamcast to me, like that's like the pinnacle of my friendship with the other the co-owner Josh. We we grew up playing Dreamcast and Fantasy Star Online. Like if I ever want to go back into like what I felt was a simpler time, I can just play Fantasy Star Online and I feel like I'm back in like. Seventh grade, but or whatever. Seventh grade actually wasn't that great, but that game got me through. So I put the picture of the kid who gets to 64 because you know that's the feeling I have growing up. Like I remember getting my Super Nintendo and freaking out, and then being disappointed I got Super Mario instead of Zelda. But then I traded that with the girl across the street because she didn't understand how to play it, so it worked out. And then, um... so I just wanted to first comment because I think a lot of people. I don't know if any of you guys have kind of gotten some crap for your collecting, like either your girlfriend or boyfriend or just from your friends in general, they're like, why do you have so much junk? And I think sometimes people have a difficulty realizing like why collecting video games are important, but really people have been collecting since forever. I mean, all the way back to like 300 P BC, we know a book and art collections that people had. People have always liked having things physically. I mean. You know, libraries have existed for a long time, but many people still like to collect books. Of course, you can go search pictures of art on the internet, but, I mean, it's not the same, right? So, it's important to know that you're not weird and that you're not, this isn't a new thing. <clears throat> Collecting is not a new phenomenon, and so we're not here to, hopefully no one is shaming you anyways, but you can 
fight back with that and say that people have always been doing it. So next I want to talk about, okay. Oh, same no. thing. No, we're good. <laughs> I was just, yeah, I was just going to comment on the golden <laughs> age. So to me, the golden age of physical media started with the Nintendo. Um, Atari was out there, but it was still relatively not as popular as like Nintendo was. So here's a bunch of great games that I pointed out. There's the Fantasy Star Online insert, so I had to put that there. And there's a reason why I put it from 1985 to 2006, which we'll get into in the next slide. So during this time period, this is when physical was a huge deal. Um, this is when you could go to Blockbuster, rent games. There was, you know, this is before streaming. This is back when the, your only option was physical. There, the, the internet wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. You be, like you weren't going to dial up these games. Um, the most you could do back then, I guess, would have been emulators, but that would have been pretty close to the age of broadband. So, going, do you have any comment on this? Not really. I think that this is is pretty much known. I mean, we're all here probably buying some of these games today. But I do want to say that it's not fair to leave Atari out of this. It, it's not. I don't think it's as collectible these days, but that doesn't make it any less. I mean, it's not like you could download the Atari games back then, too. So. It's true. I just I didn't want to bring up ET <laughs> with everybody, so. But you're right, I should have put Atari here. <laughs> now we're going to go to what I consider the downfall of physical. So, this is what I feel is the downfall. It started with Xbox 360. So everybody was excited about it because Xbox Live Arcade was awesome. Xbox Live got better and better, but people weren't realizing this was a sign of things to come. So, for example, um, there was a lot of great games that are digital only. For like Castle Crashers, it's still digital only. Granted, it's still available. Um, but with Xbox 360 kind of like pushing the way, and Steam at the time when Xbox 360 out, came out was still relatively like not as well known, at least with my group of friends. Like PC gaming was still there and a lot of people played it, but Steam hadn't grown into the giant it is yet. Um, and then PS3 followed with that, and then you have PSN that came with it, as well as PS4 now and Xbox One. And there's so many digital services available on this. There's a lot of like, that's why, that's kind of how Limited Run started. We saw all these games there and we were like, hey, we should start making these games physical because it's not fair that this is the only way to play it. I just want to add, like, when you have a game that is released digitally and, you know, even for these companies, not like, you know, we all know that Origin, actually, I don't know if you know this, but Origin will sometimes, like, just take away your games for no reason. And we'll sort of get into that more uh, more in a later slide, but these games aren't necessarily here to stay. And of course, there's many other reasons to have a physical version rather than just keeping it around, because of course you can resell and that sort of thing. But we'll get we'll get into that more in the next slides. So, with the advent of Xbox 360 and PS3 came Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network, like I was just saying. So these were great options at the time, and they're still great options for a lot of people, because I'm not going to lie, every once in a while I get lazy and I don't want to get the disc if I own it digitally, I'm like, whatever. Um, and also, like, there's, you know, uh, PlayStation Gold and Xbox, wait, what the heck did I just say? PlayStation Plus and Xbox Live Gold, which are great ways to get free games every month, and a lot of the times it's games I already own, and then that just saves me the trouble of getting up all the time, um, which is not really good. It means I'm lazy. <laughs> They are, they are great options, and they show a lot of people like more games out there. It's, it's a better way for indie developers, uh, especially with like Mighty Rabbit. It was a, a lot easier for us to get games out that way, because there is a huge price tag on physical, and that's a huge hurdle for a lot of developers, and again, that's another reason why Limited Run started. But these kind of things are what affect retro stores. So it, because of these, there's not as many games available. Like you'll, you'll find ones from like the Golden Age, and you'll find like AAA games, but for example, because Castle Crashers, I'm just going to keep going back to that because I love that game, is something that you're not going to be able to get at like a store. You can only get it online. Yeah, I think that's a good point to bring up like just that, uh, sorry, I'm totally losing my train of thought today. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are lots of games that have this hurdle, these uh, indie developers and stuff, and that's sort of yeah where your company comes in, but these indie developers don't want to do physical in case the game doesn't sell well, right? So buying a physical game is important to continue to show these developers that it is worth it Another to keep thing, making physical games. Another thing that's bad about digital stores versus physical that I'm not a fan of is I know a lot of people still in rural areas that can't get internet service that can like use these or they have like a data cap. 
So like that month, they might be able to download three games, or like if it's like Assassin's Creed Unity, they can download the patch and that's it. So that's another hurdle for digital stores. Like if they had just had a, like a complete edition of the game, or like let's say developer. And another thing is developers are more reliant on patches now. So one thing that we like to do is try to get the games when they're fully patched and try to include all the DLC if we can. That's always up to the developer though. But if it's just available physically um, and they rushed it and it's not patched, then you have an incomplete game. Like I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead, I worked at Ubisoft, so I'm just gonna trash everything we did. Assassin's Creed Unity, vanilla, the way it was, is unplayable. Like you, unless you have the complete edition with all the DLC, which I'm not even sure if that exists, um, you're not gonna be able to do it. So that's, that's a bad thing. But however, if you had really fast internet and stuff, this is a good option for you. But for those people out in like the country who can't do it or have satellite internet, they're stuck playing this broken game unless they go to their friend's house and download it. And let's talk about the horrible part of digital gaming. Yeah, so this is sort of what I was touching on earlier is we have a lot of games now that at any point, you know, the licensing for certain things expires and you can no longer buy them. So there are these great games that didn't have physical releases like Scott Pilgrim, which has an amazing soundtrack and is a really fun game, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Reshelled, uh, Outrun, PT, of course, a lot of people were selling their, you know, their consoles with PT installed on eBay for like $600, $700. So this, is, this can start to be a problem when you have games that you can no longer buy and there's not a physical version out there floating around for you to go find somewhere. You may have to just find somebody who had already downloaded it and buy their entire console from them. So you're still doing a physical transaction at this point if you want to play that game, right? Yeah, it's sad. Like, as much as I'm still new to Twitch and the way it works, that's kind of like the only way you can see PT now. Like, you will never actually be able to experience yourself. Um, and it's actually, like, the whole PT thing is the reason why I haven't upgraded my PS4's hard drive or even bought the Pro, because I'm scared that I'm going to lose it forever if I switch my account over or if I try to transfer everything. Like, if something goes wrong, then PT's gone forever. And I'll never be able to show my friends that. Yeah, and the licensing thing, going back to that, especially with music and stuff, can be really weird, too, because you even get that sometimes with physical versions. So, for instance, like, uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas got another release on 360 and PS3, but they removed, like, 20 songs from it because the licensing had run out on those songs. So if they had been... I mean, they were able to at least just remove the songs and re-release it, but if that's too much of the game, you know, if that's the entire soundtrack or something like that, then... Uh, <laughs> then you lose, I mean, you lose the capability to sell that entirely and buy it. Touching on the Grand Theft Auto thing, I had recently downloaded the, the trilogy because it was on sale, and I kept playing Vice City, and I kept waiting for Billie Jean to come on, and it just never happened, and I was like, what the heck's going on? And I had to look it up, and I was like, that is really sad. Yep, and they don't really like make that public either. That's kind of some info you have to dig out. It's not like when they re-release it, they're advertising that they lost a bunch of the content, right? That would be silly, but, but it's disappointing. And Castle of Illusions on here because that just happened, so like, you're not able to get that game anymore. It's gone, and then like you know Scott Pilgrim is a big like wound for a lot of people, and I keep going back to that because that is also a great game. And I'm friends with the company that came from that game, which is Tribute Games. Like they did Mercenary Kings, Curses, and Chaos, and like they were even telling me like it's it's ridiculous. Like Ubisoft just lost the rights because they didn't choose to renew it for whatever reason, and now that game's gone. <coughs> And that's a company too, everybody's like, you should get that for physical, and I'm like, it's Ubisoft, like, I work there, it's just not going to happen. So now let's talk about companies and stores that are fighting digital. Um, there's Limited Run Games as an example, I'm just going to keep plugging my own crap. <laughs> we got IndieBox, which I'm a huge fan of, so I, I really enjoyed PC gaming as a kid, that was like one of the first things my dad was teaching me was um, basically how to use DOS and log into Windows and play Doom on every cubicle at the CDC, because he was a scientist there. And there you go, everybody at CDC was playing Doom. Um, then you have awesome retro stores like Pink Gorilla, and that's not just a, like a plug for her, I, like, I legitimately like that store. Um, and like I enjoy finding those. We don't have a lot where I'm from in North Carolina. We have like the fairgrounds and all those are like just really bad. And, like They're just there to steal your money. And they have no idea what they're talking about. There's obviously a ton of retro stores here at this convention. That's probably why you're here in the first place. So. Uh, and IndieBox, you didn't mention, they just did a partnership with GameStop. They just announced like a few
few days ago. So there's going to be $20 physical release PC games. Uh, they're partnering with GameStop with like a steelbook, I believe. Yep. So pretty cool deal. I'm, I mean, I'm not a big PC person myself, but I'm just glad to see physical happening on all the fronts because PC is sort of the one that gets forgotten when it comes to physical versus digital. Yeah. So any of you that grew up like collecting, like I still have the Half-Life box at my house. Um, and then Quake had a really nice box. Like they're just PC, just the way it was, it took up too much store shelf. You have uh, like awesome internet now. So that's the whole reason why Steam got bigger. You can just download it. And a lot of people disk drive, I don't have a disk drive on this thing, which sucks. Um, it's just, that's the sad part. And that's why I like IndieBox a lot. Like they have the steel books, like she said at GameStops now, even though I'm not a huge GameStop person, but you know, it's a necessary evil. Um, and I'm really proud of them, and I'm proud of the big boxes they do. Like, if you don't have a subscription, think about getting one, because the stuff that they do with that is really awesome. They just did Stanley Parable, uh, and they have Jotun coming out this month. And then we'll, you want to hit the arrow? Ta-da. Um, you so that's you guys. Yeah, so I guess I'll talk about your company. I don't know, you should talk about your company. But the cool thing about Limited Run Games, of course, is that they are taking games that have never been physical, and making other than Shantae, I guess, and <laughs> and making a physical release for them. So it's cool because some of these games were kind of digging back far. Um, things like Shadow Complex. I mean, that game came out quite a while ago, but they're digging back and finding these games that people really enjoyed. But people like me, I mean, I very rarely download digital games. Is there anyone else who like basically doesn't download digital games? There's a few of you. Yeah. Okay. So this makes me go, oh, a lot of people enjoyed that game. I'm now going to go back and actually play it because it's an accessible, you know, I can hold it in my hands at this point. I don't know why that's so important to me, but <laughs> but it prevents me from playing otherwise really good games sometimes. Cool. Uh, I like, like the facts, like what she was saying, is we, we just started last year. This is our anniversary, actually. October 28th is the day we started with our launch of Breach and Clear. Um, right now, we only support PS4 and Vita. We were trying with Microsoft. We actually used Shadow Complex as an example of why they should work with us. We said, hey, here's a game that was exclusive to you. Now Sony has a physical version of it. How does that make you feel? And they were like, we don't care. <laughs> so that being said, if there's someone in here, please work with me if you're from Microsoft. But Nintendo, on the other hand, basically just kind of gave us this ridiculously long uh, form to fill out. And I don't know if we can do it. They also want examples of like data from our company that I've never had to do before. And it's very old school. And then like even then, Nintendo told us, like, don't count on being accepted. So that one was kind of hard. That's one of the reasons why we started talking to companies like Kobe Tecmo for Fatal Frame, is that they could do it and we could just act as a distribution. So we would pay the money for them to do it because they don't want to pay for it because they don't see the reason for doing it. But if we can convince them that, hey, we can do all the work for you, then maybe they would say yes. But because of the way Nintendo's treating the Wii U right now and with the Switch coming out, it's kind of pointless at this point. Um, Again, we just launched our first PC game. Um, I didn't want to step on IndieBox's toes, but they approached us and they asked us to do it. Um, at the time, I was in Japan when I had to meet, have this meeting, and I kept telling the guy, I was like, we don't do PC. And he was like, okay, well, we really want to do a PC game with you. And I was like, okay, cool, we don't do PC. I was like, you should talk to IndieBox. He was like, no, I want to talk to you. And I was like, okay. And then later it got kind of ridiculous because then they did start talking to IndieBox and I was talking to IndieBox and I was like, what's happening? He was like, I have no idea. I guess they were trying to get us to budge on something, but we had the exact same business model. So I was like, we're not going to switch that all of a sudden. Um, the nice thing about that was I did say yes while I was in Japan to do it, even though I didn't want to. And then it turned out to be a Suda 51 game. And then at that point, I was like, well, I'm definitely not saying no. Um, and another thing is our whole idea is to preserve games. So Josh and I have huge collections of games. Um, this is like basically our whole like friendship was based around being video gamers um, and collecting stuff. Like, that's just something we do, you know. Our wives aren't huge fans of it, but I don't know. Actually, I think I've converted my wife. Um, and then we, we cater to collectors. Like, that's that's our fan base, you know. Collectors and, uh, unfortunately, resellers. It's a, it's a natural balance. So there's people here selling my games for triple price, and I'm selling them for 25 and I'm like, what the heck is happening? And I think preserve is definitely the key word here. Like I was saying with Shadow Complex, I mean, this game would eventually be lost to time. You know, we... At some point, the service would run out. People would not be on the 360 anymore, not using, you know, on like the PS6 or whatever, and the Xbox Zero. I don't know how what they're going to name their <laughs> their console next, but 
you know, they, I mean, these things are eventually going to be lost to time if we don't find a physical version. And another good thing about that, like Shadow Complex is a great example because it had already come out, it's, all, it's an older title, and yet when we put it out, it sold out. Had GameStop had decided to put that out, though, it would have been lost in the shuffle. Like, people would have been like, what is this on the shelf? It would have got clearanced out, and then Epic would have had a game that was devalued. So with our games, we help the developers keep the value to their game, and people are like, what is this? I need to get it. And then more people were familiar with that developer, whereas at GameStop, it could have ended up in a clearance bin or a Toys R Us. I find a lot of old Vita games there. Um, that are like under 20 bucks, and it's just a shame. More in the indie box, you know, they do physical PC stuff. Uh, they found it in 2014. Uh, they do collector's editions. They just recently started doing um, like standard editions. They just did Owlboy, um, which is just its own disc, and then they have the GameStop deal they just did. Um, they're subscription based, they cater to the collectors as well, people that miss the feeling of getting those big boxes. Um, and yeah. Do you have any indie boxes? I don't. I'm not really a big PC person, but they I like plushies. what they do. Yeah, don't you want a plushie? <laughs> That's another cool Where thing. Where am I going to put those? I don't know, on that, on those awesome shelves in your videos. You just hide it there They're or something. Already, like, I know. <laughs> I'm scared for you. I feel like it's going to collapse <laughs> on you one day. Target shelves probably not the best, uh, <clears throat> best tar choice. Target's there. nice. Yeah, but I have, like, I have them like stacked on top of each other. There you go. Walmart would have been bad. Putting those together, they break. Um, again, IndieBox is a great company. They're helping fight the fight on PC. A lot of people still miss that. Um, unfortunately, it is kind of like an uphill battle for them because of Steam. A lot of people see... The great thing about them, though, is if you don't want to open their box, they come with Steam keys. So a lot of people that want to hold on to these and collect them and keep them sealed um, can do that. Now we're getting to retro stores. I put two examples on here just real quick. I'm not really that familiar with GameStar. I have met Video Game Wizards, and they're real cool. Um, but I haven't met the GameStar guys, but I did look up and see what they do. And they are, I guess, probably the two biggest ones in Portland. Anybody here know that for sure? Pretty much. Pretty much? Cool. I didn't make they that up then. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's tons and tons of retro stores. No matter where you're from, there probably is one. I've talked to a lot of people from, like, California, and they tell me that there's not a whole lot of them, but they can still, with some prodding, they can still usually name one. So, you're lying to me, Californians. But... <laughs> There, there's retro game stores everywhere. I, I like that Douglas said they're typically knowledgeable. We are, we're knowledgeable. I have, I've had one or two people who, you know, the teenagers who came from GameStop or whatever and may not know exactly what they're talking about, but it's a great way to meet other people that of course are like-minded collectors. I know for me, I mean, I own a game store, but I still go to the other retro game stores and sometimes they'll even call me up and say, hey, here's this like, Rare DS game we got in. I mean, if you become, if you go into these stores and you make an effort to talk to them, talk about what your passions are, listen to what their passions are, they're going to think of you and they're going to help you find the games that you're looking for too. So, and this touches on the selling part. So, this is a really, really, really big part of why we like physical games. I know we don't want to, we all have our collections, but in a bind, guess what? We could sell it and we'd be okay. You know, if we're about to be evicted or we have some big medical bill, and I see this happen pretty often, unfortunately, but this is something that we've, you know, you were putting the, that money into those games anyways, even if you were buying them digitally, but what are you going to do if you have that big bill and you've put that money into the games, but they're not worth anything anymore because they're just on there digitally. So having a physical copy, being able to sell and trade, go to a show like this, you know, trade with people, sell them if you need to, sell the doubles if you want to. You know, a lot of people will buy like a big lot off of eBay or Craigslist or that sort of thing and then you can trade or sell the doubles. That's not a luxury that you have with digital media at all. Another problem with that whole digital thing is a lot of people don't realize this, but I see it happen all the time in stores while I'm there visiting or trying to like find something rare. They'll come in with an Xbox and they'll be like, hey, I have over like $300 worth of digital games on here. How much will you give me for it? And they're like, the same price we would with one that doesn't have this because it's a privacy concern. Yep. Your personal information on there and people don't seem to realize that. Like I used to sell cell phones, like we have to wipe that stuff. Like you can't just sell that. Yep. Like, you were telling me you see it all the time. Yep, we reformat and wipe all of the consoles that come through because you, yeah, a lot of them are actually tied to any, you know, to some sort of personal information, sometimes even like credit card information. So we wipe all of that and unfortunately, your games are gone. And then there you go, you just wasted hundreds of dollars because 
let's pretend the store shuts down or like Xbox One isn't always compatible with some games you bought or same with like PS4 or PS3. Those games are gone and when those stores shut down, you just, you're not going to be able to re-download them. Had you had a physical though, you could have found like one of those consoles at a pawn shop one day and then played your collection again or started rebuilding it. But if it's digital, there's no you can't really rebuild it. You're just spending money again. Like if they did board it eventually, you're just buying your game again. Um, and again, I did spend like 10 minutes debating on the typically knowledgeable part. Uh, I realized she was going to say something to me when I did that. I only did that because an example is I went into a pawn shop, um, or it wasn't a pawn shop, it was a game store, like one of the few retro ones we have, like in the middle of nowhere in North Carolina, and I brought Breach and Clear with me for Vita. And I went in there trying to see if I could get some trade credit just to see what, what would a store like this give me. The lady told me it wasn't worth anything because it was $25 on her website, and she said it... Um, that, that's what she said. It's worth $25 on there. I wouldn't even give you $5. I said, did you check eBay? And she said, we don't check eBay. And I'm like, well, you're making a huge mistake because this game is sold out. And she was like, I don't care. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, okay. That's um, not a retro store that's going to be around. For yeah. And they also had games in their cases that were just way overpriced. They were asking way more than like Amazon uh, and, and more than eBay. And I was just like, what are you doing? Um, again, that was in the middle of nowhere. So it's only a matter of time. Cool, now we're gonna get into some fun stuff. We're gonna put this little thing up here real quick. This is the thank you. It's not quite over yet, but you can follow me on Twitter. You can also follow Kelsey. Uh, we post a lot of cool stuff. She does a lot, of, she has a gaming blitz podcast. She also just launched her own channel. She does a lot of great stuff. Um, she also finds really cool stuff and posts it on Twitter, like when she's out visiting a store. She also posts stuff that happens at her store. Like they get some of the coolest stuff in. Um, and it makes me jealous because uh, like she's in Seattle and I'm about to be like, hey, hold that for me. I'll be right there. Just get on the plane. It's fine. Yeah. I just have to keep waiting until PAX. Um, right. I guess we can open up the floor to any questions. Uh, we have the mic somewhere. I don't know, Cody, if you want to grab that. Maybe. The no. first thing I want to do, though, before q <laughs> Okay. While we're figuring that out. As I do, you, those who came in when it started, uh, you got a raffle ticket. Today we'll be raffling two things. We have Saturday Morning RPG for PS4. So that was a big surprise. And then we also have an Octodad tie. <laughs> so let me go break these up first. Yeah, yeah. Well, if anyone has a question they just want to like, shout out right now, yeah, go ahead. You know, it's kind of less of a question, more of just like an observation. I don't feel like physical and visual is really important these days. I mean, like using Assassin's Creed uses these that's a good point, and that's part of why it's important for these companies to, first of all, finish their games before they release them. I see a lot of nodding heads, yeah. <laughs> finish the games. And... And not, I mean, we rely right now so much on the digital services, even for physical games. So they know that they can send out a semi-broken game and just patch it right in. So you're right, there are going to be some things from, and this is why he's talking about the golden age, you know, there, there was a point where they couldn't do this. Up until the 360 and the PS3, it had to be finished. They can't just, like, have you download a patch for a lot of those games. So, I mean... I'm not exactly sure how to combat this, except for yelling a lot and getting angry. <laughs> but we definitely have an issue where we're relying too much on the on the digital. What I would suggest, though, if you're like one of those people that has to buy the game when it comes out, which is is me, um, and then you end up getting the broken game, keep that edition for yourself. And then if you really wanted to play it, or actually, I would what I would do is buy it, trade it in once you're done with it after all the patches come out, and then. Um, buy the greatest hits version whenever that comes out. Open that one, and then find or like, and then find another sealed copy of the the original label, if because those are the ones that are usually worth the most money. That or buy two when you buy it, and make sure you keep one sealed. Well, that's for collectors who like to keep one sealed and open one, which is what we try to cater to. Um, because Josh on Limited Run is very much like that. Me personally, I don't do that as often. It really depends on the game. I typically buy all my games and open them. Um, but Josh is one of those people that loves to buy one and then keep one sealed. And he always buys the one of the original ones. And then later he trades that in, gets credit for whatever store he traded in, and then he'll buy like a Greatest Hits version to play later because it's complete or it comes with all the DLC. 
I think at the very least, it's mostly AAA titles that are guilty of this, or the most guilty of it, which means that there probably will be a second print of it. That's the silver lining on this, I guess, is the second print will usually have most of those fixes on it. All right, you want to do a raffle? Yeah. Um, this will be for Saturday Morning RPG. I'll let Kelsey pick it. Okay. All right. The number is eight, four, five, nine, two, three, five. Okay. You got it? Yeah. You can come on up and get it. Short sure. ticket. Thank you. Yep. Congratulations. You're welcome. And now for an Octodad tie. And we'll go back to questions. Eight, four, five, nine, two, five, zero. Suspense. Oh, Woo. you got a shirt that can fit a tie. <laughs> All right. I guess we can just open up the floor to questions at this point. If you have any questions about limited run games, about having a retro store, or anything we've talked about. Right there. Uh, question for Douglas. Uh, uh, you all release a lot of, you know, independent games on physical media. Uh, do you foresee anything in the future where you're going to be day and date release with the digital version? So, we did do that once. Lost City actually came out at the same time. Um, I'm not typically a big fan of that because I do want, I don't trust people to have their games patched. Um, the only other, there's a couple games that we have signed that like I could see them being pretty well done, like Cosmic Star Heroine. It's still not even out because they're polishing the game so much and like they're trying to keep the frame rate at a constant 60. Um, even on Vita, they have the frame rate ridiculous. Like there's like no loading times on the Vita, which is ridiculous. But they even told us then like we don't want to do that. We want to patch before you do a physical because they understand like something could happen. So I do see that happening, and that would only be because the developer wanted it. We always suggest not to do that, but we have so many games signed at the moment that it's going to be inevitable. Like, we need to get these games out. Like, we get a lot of flack for people saying, like, you release too many games in a month. And we're like, well, if we don't, then you're not going to see these games ever, because, like, they have to come out. And, like, example is Shantae's coming out next Friday, um, and we just basically gave everybody, like, a whole month break. Like, we only had uh, One Way Heroics and Thomas was alone for, like, October. And November is going to be really busy, and we've already started getting people going, like, I don't have any money after, like, you can't do this to me. And I'm like, I just gave you a whole month off, like, where, where did that money go? Like, you were going to buy these anyway. So, it, it can happen, but I'm, we're trying not to do it, but it, like I said, it'll happen. Hey there. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's nice to meet you guys. Thank you for doing the panel with Kelsey and Douglas. Um, I am a big uh, supporter of run games I bought just about everything um, and I also uh, got classic heroes and retro city rampage from other vendors who did like limited run V blank and Gaijin works yes yeah, I got so, those two so the one thing I um, was wondering that they did if you guys haven't is, that is uh, numbering your uh, games uh, both those guys you know have a little you know out of 3,000 or out of 2,000 the first question is are you guys ever gonna do that I know you can put on the website how many you have. And then the second question is, unfortunately, some of my discs, I'd say half of them I get, um, are loose. And I know you probably deal with that. I, you know, I don't, I've never one that's complained or whatever, but unfortunately, like, from PS4 to PS3, it's hard to manipulate the disc back in. Like, PS4 is kind of impossible. PS3, I can, I can work it out. And I always, like, play one, keep one sealed, like a silly collector. Um, do you guys have any remedy in the future that, is there anything you can about that since it's, it's that you are you know catering to collectors and you know so fix. first off do you have like summon night six what? did you get summon night from gaijin works no oh, okay it was their last psp release okay well let's just use vic as an example from gaijin works did you pre-order class of heroes when it first got announced uh yes how long did it take you to get that game so Vic does his releases very spaced out. He has a lot more time to put more polish on them in terms of like numbering, 
Uh, some of those came with like their own shipping boxes that looked awesome. Um, the problem with that is we are two people, we fulfill everything in house, we want to do the numbering system, but any box just stopped numbering their boxes for a reason that we, we foresaw right away would happen. Let's say you got your game in the mail and it was crushed and you were like, hey, I want the same number I got. I can't guarantee that. Like, there's just no way I could do it. Like, you could peel the sticker off and put it on the new one, but then it's obviously not where it originally was. It's going to be flimsy, and I can't reproduce the same sticker. Because, like, what if the second one I sent you got lost? That's the reason why we don't do that. We are, however, doing that with our PC release that we just did. Those will be numbered from the order they were received, um, and we may do that in the future for certain ones. Like, we number our vinyls. But for our regular releases, we just there's no way we'd be able to. I personally like that, but at the same time, like uh, Retro City Rampage's recent reprint uh, with the gold variant came with the numbering on it. And it was basically a sign of like you're not going to be able to open this. So I, I don't like that personally. Um, like they look cool. Like I like it if it's a game I know I don't need to open. Like Retro City Rampage, I got over it because he did include a digital key. But like if I wanted to open that one day and play it, like I just I'm going to lose the number. Um, so that's that one. The we'll lose this thing I have good news is. We started taking videos of that because like that comes up a lot with us and a lot of people like to say it's a limited run thing, but I get games in the mail all the time from Amazon, Best Buy, and they're always loose. Uh, but people blame us because you're only dealing with me. You're not going to a store. So like somebody like Activision probably has tons of loose discs with their games, but they don't know about it because people are saying that to GameStop or Best Buy. So like we get a lot of flack for it because people are directly talking to us and I talk to you directly. Like I'm just, we're very easy to get a hold of. So we sent all these videos to, to PlayStation because we or Sony because we showed them how easy it was. Like we took a disc and Josh went crazy. He was like a mad scientist for a whole day doing these experiments and walking around the office on Mighty Rabbit going, "Look how easy this is!" And he was just walking around. And he just went like this barely, and they pop out. So all it takes is like one of the guys with our bubble mailer is like holding the package, put it in your mailbox. He pops it out. Um, we don't ship them loose. I can guarantee that. Yeah. But we are going to, in order to fight this until Sony comes up with a new solution we're going to start trying to ship in boxes more. We were gonna order our own personal boxes and put bubble wrap in it to help fight it. But I still can't guarantee that they won't because the PlayStation VR, I just got that from Amazon, came in a giant box, and then it came in the VR box, and then that came in a little box, and then my demo disc was loose. So triple box, and it was still loose. So, any more questions? Take a couple more. Uh, I like the blue shirt. We'll do blue shirt and then yellow shirt. As far as games that are digital only now being on physical release, what's your dream game for both of you? Um, well, in our documentary, we said Fantasy Star Online 2, which doesn't make any sense for me to do it, but I would love to see it. Um, I would also like to see Yakuza 5, even though I've been told no already several times. Um, Scott Pilgrim's a dream. And then Fatal, I am Fatal Frame. Is I, mine. I'm trying. I got, I got a contact. Are you? Okay. Yeah. There's one. You that, heard it here first, guys. They are trying. Yeah. I mean, that is a Sony thing, so it's possible. Yeah. There is one that everybody had been asking for that we recently did get, and I can't wait to announce that, because that was one of the games I said when we started the company that, like, my goal is to get this game, and I got it. Is it Jamestown? No. Damn. I didn't say that, so. <laughs> it's not Jamestown. We are trying to get a hold of them, but, like, that company's so broken up right now, it's hard to figure out who to talk to. Next question, let's go with this gentleman. Yeah, so, um, I... I track all my collection in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, you know, then a call for a game, instruction manual box. I notice a lot of games now don't have an instruction manual. My question is, how much do they really save by not putting in an instruction manual? Like 50 cents, a buck, what do you think? It's like, you it's like, it's like 10 cents. It's, it depends, 10 cents per unit. I mean, 10 cents times a million? Is a semi-significant amount of money, but yeah, it's frustrating when, you know, when they are also selling a million of them, right? Like, It's also time. A lot of developers don't want to put the time into it because they know it's accepted now not to put a manual in it, so they won't do it. For example, for Vita, Sony gave us a template for it, and the template was just a flyer. It was like a one-page thing. We actually had to pay someone to develop a manual for us because Sony did not have one. Yeah, even on like the PS3 and PS4, sometimes when you get a manual, it's like a slip of paper. So, to answer your question, they're not saving that much, but I guess, like, you know, Destiny saved a good amount of money would be an example, but it's not enough to be like, you should have done one anyway. Sir? He already said it was a no, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a five. I was just so happy that the game came out at all. Like, I played it on, like, five or five minutes. Um, he 
said that you like looked into that, but like, what were kind of the obstacles? Like, what was like the reason? Um, so like we got kind of a vague answer, one of the ones they kind of told us, like they actually took our pitch, went to Sega, uh, went up through the chain and they looked at it and they said they liked it, but they, one of their reasons was licensing. There's a lot of stuff in that like they would have to get approved for. Um, like stuff in the game. Yeah. Even though it's already out digitally, it doesn't make sense. The biggest thing I think they said, and this is a lot of people have asked us to do Sonic Mania and it's the same reason why we won't be able to is they feel like it's a slap to the face to people who bought the digital version. Because they said there'd be no physical, and they want to stick to that because now that everybody is like, oh, well, there's never going to be one, I don't have a choice, bought it. And then if they were to come back and be like, just kidding, here's one, they feel like all those customers would be mad. Even though they're wrong, there's people like me that would double or even triple dip for that kind of thing. So Sonic Mania is one of those two that people asked us to, and we immediately got the same answer. Right. Sir? From a publishing perspective, how do you find a balance on publishing enough quantities of a game satis to potentially satisfy the, the customer base but not oversaturate you? That is probably the hardest thing we have to do. Um, and a few times we've been wrong in both respects, like too many or too, too little. Soldner is a huge example of one that was way too small. Um, the reason for that being that contract was signed very early on and the developer sold, told us that it didn't sell that well digitally. So when it sold out in two minutes, he was shocked. And we were like, there's no, we're not, we don't do reprints. That goes against everything we say, so we couldn't. We even tried upping the number because I had a feeling it was going to sell out. We were able to make it 3,200 instead of 3,000. But that was an example of one that wasn't balanced. Octodad's an example of one that took three days to sell out um, because we overgaged interest in it. It was a huge title. It was one of our dream titles we wanted. But apparently not enough people think Octodad's worth paying $25 for it even though I think it's a great polished game, but it is short. Um, so that's something we have a lot of debates about. Josh and I go back and forth through each office, uh, basically agreeing to what a print size is, and then we reevaluate after every launch. Like, if a game took three days to sell, we might lower it a little. Um, we can take one last question. Question for uh, Kelsey. Uh, being up in the Seattle area, are there any like really obscure Nintendo uh, memorabilia that's ever come through your store? Uh, it happens. I mean, it's not. It's certainly not an everyday thing. But we are in Seattle, blessed to be in an area that's got a bunch of ex Nintendo and ex Microsoft employees. I get the cool Microsoft stuff way more than the cool Nintendo stuff. I think it's they probably just don't police it quite as well. Nintendo's known for being very heavy on that sort of thing. Uh, the coolest thing that's come through the store is we have a statue of Star Fox um, from Nintendo, so that one's pretty cool. But yeah, we've had all kinds of like, uh, you know, developer consoles and that sort of thing from Microsoft. Cool. Well, we have to go. The panel's over now. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thanks, guys.